So hello everybody, this is Bunte Joe here and just here I'm um, actually at the new Quit Dealer building and actually can't see it but right behind me is actually a very steep drop so I uh, have to uh, be careful not to uh, lean back too much right now. <laughs> um, but I uh, thought that could do a short um, Dhamma discussion for the internet. So maybe we could start with just a little bit of meditation. So we can lean forward a bit and arch the spine and look about three feet in front and close our eyes. And can focus in on the breath. Can know when it's coming in and know when it's going out. If we breathe in a long breath, can just know I'm breathing in a long breath. And if we breathe in a short breath, can just know I'm breathing in a short breath. And can focus in on the breath at the tip of the nose. And when focusing on the breath at the tip of the nose, can try to make awareness as continuous as possible. Being aware all the way through the in-breath as the in-breath turns to the out-breath, all the way through the out-breath, <clears throat> and as the out-breath turns back to the in-breath again, trying to make awareness as continuous as possible. And before we finish meditating, can spread thoughts of goodwill. Wishing may all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. And we can make the mind infinite, can make it unbounded all the way to the ends of the universe and beyond in every dimension may all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease
and can open our eyes and do a short reflection on the Dhamma. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang sarananga chami dhammang sarananga chami sangang sarananga chami Dutiyampi buddhang sarananga chami dutiyampi dhammang sarananga chami dutiyampi sangang sarananga chami Tatiyampi buddhang sarananga chami tatiyampi dhammang sarananga chami tatiyampi sangang sarananga chami So, hello everybody. Uh, I've got a few questions um, here from a friend, Marcelo, and thought to try to record a short Dhamma discussion about them. So this is the differences between skillful and unskillful desires like lust and greed. When does worrying about money in today's volatile economic situation become unskillful? How does lust invade the mind and affect one's practice? How to skillfully navigate one's way, uh, let's see, how to, oh, my writing is hard to read. How to skillfully navigate uh, on a, away from it and set on a more skillful path. So basically the, the differences between um, skillful and unskillful desires is, uh, is more or less that skillful desires <clears throat> are ones that lead to wholesome qualities of mind, which lead to <clears throat> long-term happiness. Unskillful desires are ones that lead to unwholesome qualities of mind and uh, lead to kind of long-term unhappiness. One of the often, not always, but often, one of the basic differences between them is that sometimes unskillful desires will have this um, overwhelming urge to do them and they give a quick result uh, that's very kind of uh, 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 strongly present, strongly pleasant immediately but the more one engages in that unskillful desire, the, more un the less pleasant that thing becomes and the more the kind of long-term negative consequences come up. So kind of maybe like eating candies is like this. If one eats a candy, it's this big rush, you know, and uh, it, uh, you know, tastes really good right away, gives this really powerful flavor. But the more that one engages in eating candy, the kind of less uh, satisfying that candy becomes. Sometimes the more one needs to consume to get the same feeling. And at the same time, the more these negative consequences come up, like, uh, you know, maybe kind of all kinds of bad health consequences can come from eating too much candy. Skillful desires, on the other hand, tend to map in the opposite direction. They tend to be ones that uh, sometimes one has to kind of uh, uh, force oneself to do because they, um, they, have, uh, they have this quality where they bring long-term benefits, but sometimes short-term pain. So just another kind of, uh, you know, uh, example from the everyday world would be something like going out to the gym to exercise or so. Uh, at first when one does it, then um, one, uh, you know, uh, then one uh, it kind of experiences pain from the exercising, <laughs> kind of physical pain. But long term, one becomes more and more healthy. So, and the pain that one gets from the exercise tends to diminish. The more one does it, the pleasant feelings become more and more. These aren't the only ways to classify it. There are also things that are pleasant and give good results, and also things that are painful and give bad results. So, but the Buddha says the way that one can know oneself in terms of what he calls kind of a manly perseverance, in terms of this ability to kind of um, uh, power through in the face of difficulties. Uh, the difficult ones are these ones that are uh, pleasant to do now but hard in the future. The ones that are, uh, or to avoid those, the ones that are difficult to do are the ones that are uh, painful now and pleasant in the future. But the Buddha's teachings, this is why we have a teacher like the Buddha, and it's good to have a knowledge of what he taught in the suttas because you can't really come up with a quick formula like this is always skillful, this is always unskillful. That's why we have these kind of large bodies of religious teachings as to what's skillful, what's unskillful. Uh, the basic ones that are unskillful or that, are, you know, so we've got the precepts, these various things, and maybe beyond the scope of the video to go into all the sorts of 
skillful and unskillful desires, but uh, maybe enough to know that the Buddha lays out a kind of, um, uh, you know, enough to discuss that the Buddha lays out this kind of uh, very uh, detailed map of what's, uh, what's skillful, what's unskillful. And so when one studies that and tries to apply it, that's when one learns in one's own life. Probably one more note about skillful and unskillful desires is that one of the tricky points between them is that there can be these cases where one pursues a particular quality and it's wholesome at the beginning, but eventually it becomes unwholesome. So some of them like that are kind of, you know, effort can be like that. It can be good to put forth effort in one's meditation practice to a certain extent, but when one puts forth too much effort, then one can hurt oneself. And one can kind of uh, overdo it. Uh, even qualities that people might think are um, always good, like there's a quality like compassion. Compassion can go too far if one has so much compassion that one starts to harm oneself and one's giving away to other people or one develops compassion too much uh, or in an unbalanced way to the point where one is always feeling sad or angry that there's injustice in the world, which there's always, there's always injustice in the world. So this is why he gives these kind of Faculty, this is why the Buddhist path of skillful desire is one, um, uh, is one that's uh, balanced. It's called the middle path because there's a kind of balance point that one has to develop a skill in. And this is why it's not just something that one can learn by rote in a book. It's something that one has to practice. Ideally, one has the examples of teachers or, um, or people who are further along the path uh, than one around oneself so that one can see how they operate in this, in this situation, how they operate in that situation. One can learn from observing them what the balance point is for these various types of um, skillful desires, skillful qualities of mind. So then the next one is, um, the diff sorry, is the difference between skillful and unskillful desires like lust and greed. So, um, so as far as the difference between lust and greed, basically Lust, in terms of the Buddhist teachings, in terms of putting an end to suffering, is something that's always, uh, is always seen as bad, always seen as an obstacle. There's this um, sutta that Venerable Ananda gives where uh, there's a bhikkhuni who falls in love with him and she tries to seduce him. And he goes and gives her a talk. Um, she, I think she, she pretends she's sick and tries to get him to come to see her. And he says, you know, one can use, kind of goes through, can use basically pride, you know, uh, you know, one can use desire to overcome desire, pride to overcome pride. In other words, one hears, oh, somebody over there attained our hunchip, why not me? I'm not sure if it's that sutta, but also there's other suttas, you know, where he talks about, you know, you use desire, you have this desire. There's one where he talks about, um, a different where he talks about kind of going to the park. You have this desire to go to the park, and when you get to the park, your desire is allayed. In other words, we have this desire for Nibbana. When we, when we attain it, it, that desire goes away. But then he says to her, um, but in regards to lust, the Buddha has dis, uh, what he calls, well, he, he specifically says in regards to sexual intercourse, the Buddha declares the destruction of the bridge. So for people who really want to um, overcome suffering, this is one of the things that eventually one has to cut off uh, completely. Um, uh, but uh, this is why people become, uh, this is why one would become a monk or a nun, or they have kind of eight precept people. But uh, having a precept for one of complete, for one to have a precept of, say, complete 100% uh, uh, celibacy is, uh, is not something that one has to, one would have to take on necessarily as a lay person. It's just in terms of the uh, extent to which it's an obstacle on the path. The Buddha did, uh, always declared that one to basically be an obstacle. So when does worrying about money in today's volatile economic situation become unskillful? So basically, um, money, if one is living in the world, is something that one has to worry about. <laughs> um, kind of, uh, you know, there's bills to be paid, there's all these various things. But as far as uh, today's situation, it's very volatile economically. Uh, basically, one can only, it's only skillful to worry to the extent that one can change. Um, one can make a change. If it's impossible for one to make a change, or if it's already, uh, you know, there's nothing one can do, then worry just gets in the way of one making more skillful choices. One thing that can happen in situations like this is that one can think to oneself, oh, you know, I should have saved more money. <laughs> you know, I should have done this, I should have done that. <clears throat> when these kinds of desires, or, or when these kinds of thoughts come up, one can counter them by thinking, okay, I didn't do that, that wasn't good. 
but in the future I will do that. In the future I will save more. In the future I will do these various things. So one of the two important things about money that the Buddha does teach about is that he says one should have the happiness of freedom from debt. In other words, one should uh, not get into debt, uh, any debt, large or small. So basically, even if one has a credit card and one needs to buy something online, it's better to have money in one's account to pay it off right away <laughs> rather than ever going into debt. And this helps to ease any kind of worries that happen when the economy goes up or down. When the economy is really great, credit is easy, then it seems great to <laughs> take out loans, these various things. When the economy goes sour, one is left with the bill and uh, sometimes not much money to pay. So in that case, one can think, okay, look, this is a lesson that I've learned. In the future, I won't go into debt. You know, I'll do my best to avoid debt. Another important one is what he calls the achievement of the, the happiness, I think, of balanced living. In other words, one's income exceeds one ex one's expenditures. So one doesn't want to start spending so much money that uh, one, uh, one's expenditures exceeds one's income. So we should always, one should always be making more <laughs> than one spends, basically. <laughs> So again, that helps one not go into debt. So if one, doesn't, uh, if one hasn't practiced with these two types of um, things that the Buddha recommends, then worries come up about today's economic situation, okay? If there's something I can do about it, then I will. But if there's nothing I can do, uh, I'm gonna try to put those worries down. This is where meditation practice comes in. And in the future, I'll try to achieve these two uh, types of happiness, these two, two goals, this kind of happiness, the achievement of balanced living, the happiness, the achievement of freedom from debt. And so last one is, how does lust invade the mind and affects one's practice? How to skillfully navigate away from it and set forth on a more skillful path? So basically, lust invades a person's mind when they're concentrated on what the Buddha calls the theme of beauty. So this is especially the case in regards to one's own, uh, uh, to, in regards to one's own body, in regards to the bodies of other people. So actually, in the Buddhist teaching, this kind of lust comes from two angles, at least, my understanding. One is this kind of attraction to one's own body. So one, if one is a man, one kind of tends to think, oh, you know, I'm manly. They get uh, <laughs> you know, obsessed with their manly qualities. It's like manly, I can't, he gives a list, but basically like their manly appearance, their manly characteristics, you know, all these various things. And they get internally obsessed with that. Externally, they start looking for... Uh, lust, they, look, they become lustful towards the opposite. And as far as going out towards uh, lust uh, invading the mind, it kind of comes and goes out. It happens when a person is not guarded when they look at beautiful physical forms. When one looks at a beautiful physical form, there's this kind of contact, immediately lust comes in. So if one wants to start to cut off lust, if one wants to, if one wants to try to gain more from their meditation, go forward in this way in the Buddhist teachings, what one has to do when one kind of looks at anybody, one first of all tries to stop one's mind, kind of be aware before it rushes out to grab onto the beautiful characteristics. The other thing is that one wants to avoid what they call the sign of beauty. They have to bring up what they call the sign of the repulsive. In other words, one learns to imagine one's body, one's own body, the bodies of other people without skin. One learns to look at them in terms of all their kind of internal organs, kind of thinking about that again and again. When one looks at a body, okay, what's it like underneath that? There's a spleen, there's a kind of uh, uh, lower intestine, there's all these various things. And when one kind of does this continuously, then that perception comes up kind of more and more frequently. And when that perception arises, lust tends to fade away. One is just left with this feeling of, uh, of lust in, in one's mind. So then one gets to, one can maybe see more clearly at that point that, you know, lust is a kind of very harmful thing, kind of, uh, you know, why is it coming up? You know, actually, when one thinks about the body, it's kind of not like a, not like a super attractive thing. Like if you, <laughs> you know, if you look at some skin in the shower, it's disgusting. If your skin falls off your body, it's immediately disgusting when it falls off. Nails fall off, somebody's teeth, you know, whatever it is. If it's not all attached and wrapped up in skin, then it's kind of uh, something totally disgusting. You're kind of, <laughs> or kind of uh, you know, you see this sometimes during the uh, rainy season as a monk. You'll wear your robes two, three days and it's, oh, smelly. You know, <laughs> if, if anything was that smelly or needed that much care, we wouldn't really like, like if it was a laptop that started to smell that bad, you know, then uh, people wouldn't like it. But because um, uh, it's a body, there's this delusion that gets wrapped around it. 
And it's partially because of this kind of uh, lack of knowledge between skillful and unskillful desires. One has this kind of uh, desire that, uh, you know, uh, beautiful physical forms kind of uh, creates this kind of uh, maybe like immediate uh, desire or something like that. But what it does is it binds one's mind outwards. Actually, it's kind of like, uh, you know, maybe one analogy could be like, you know, you see there's these mountains behind. Sometimes they have this spring at the top and these kind of uh, creeks flow out from them. And in the same way, a lot of one's attachments to praise and blame, to pleasure, and, you know, all these various external things in the physical world, they have as a spring, one of their springs is kind of lust. It's kind of this lust and hatred. But lust, uh, this physical lust is one of the springs. So if one starts to cut it off, then at the same time, one's attachment to the external material world starts to uh, fade away bit by bit. It's like one of these springs. You cut it off at the top, and all the other little branches start to uh, be cut off towards the bottom. But this kind of thing is uh, something that one has to be very dedicated towards because the world is based uh, largely on these types of uh, desire. They're based on these desires for the external world, desires for beautiful physical bodies. Kind of go down the street, what do you see? You kind of all these advertisements for these various things. So what one has to do if one wants to cut off suffering is to cut off the desire for these things. And recognize that although these things may bring something good, you know, like some powerful good feeling right away, in the long term this is what causes me to suffer. All the suffering that I experience is because of this external attachment to the physical world. So when one sees this clearly, one develops this feeling of samwega, this kind of desire to turn away from the world, this desire for renunciation, and this is uh, maybe a very, uh, it's hard to say what the beginning of one's spiritual quest would be, really. I mean, maybe that wouldn't be the beginning, but a very important emotion. This is when one can set off on the path of renunciation. Because all of the pain that one feels in the world, whatever pain it is, it's rooted in desire. It's kind of whatever suffering one feels is rooted in desire. So when one wants to end suffering, one has to cut off desire, has to cut it off near the spring, cut it off at the root. And the fear that comes is the same as these, uh, the fear between kind of this skillful and unskillful desire. When one wants to give up candy and start exercising, it's painful, but one no longer has the benefits of candy, one no longer has the long-term benefits of exercise. And so what sustains one through that is basically faith, is basically conviction through, through observation. But if one eventually powers through that, gets this kind of skillful quality through skillful desires, then uh, one gets happiness. One sees the happiness of good health. And in the same way, when one learns to cut kind of lust out of one's mind, one learns to cut these unskillful desires, one learns to give up things that bring happiness right away, one learns to stop one's mind from rushing out to the external world, gradually one be can become more and more happy, more and more happy, more and more independent in one's happiness. It's because these external things are just like kind of a snake. You know, people love you know, people, the tail of the snake doesn't look dangerous, but when one grabs it, the head turns around and bites. You know? One learns to see the whole snake. And kind of lust going out from the mind is something that causes suffering. It's what causes, it's basically, this is basically the quality that causes people to suffer when they grow old, um, when they kind of can't uh, enjoy, you know, all these various uh, sights or sounds or all these different things cause them to suffer greatly from this. And cutting this kind of thing off, cutting off one's attachment to the material world, one gains a happiness that's more independent. So those are some thoughts on uh, skillful and unskillful desires, on lust, on money in today's <laughs> economic situation. So hope that everybody has a great day, wherever it might be, and wishing you all the best till next time.